and then I give the floor uh, to uh, Secret. Yes, so welcome to our session on four years of OER Info. Um, I am, my name is Sigrid Fahre and I work at the DIPF. This is the Leibniz Institute of Research and Information in Education in Frankfurt, Germany. And I am the project coordinator of OER Info. And um, we are very happy here to discuss with you our experiences and our learnings in the four year journey we did with uh, funding of OER in Germany. Um, I will give you a brief um, overview of our talking points and by that I will introduce my fellow panelists. Um, we start how OER Info came into being, which is presented by Jan Moimann uh, from the um, University Library Center of North Rhine-Westphalia, situated in Cologne. Maybe Jan, you can give us a big wave so we know where you are. Everybody. <laughs> Um, then I will just give you a brief overview on our goal strategies and um, the architecture of our OER Info project. And then I will give the word to Gabi Fahrenkrog of the agency Juran on Consorten. She will tell us about working with the OER community in the OER Info project. And then Juran himself um, of the same agency will introduce us to the OER camps and the networking he did in the OER sphere. Then um, Daniel, then again, Jan will tell us, um, give us an insight into connecting OER policies. Then Daniel Otto of the University of Duisburg Essen will follow with an outline of our transfer strategies. Then I will talk about our information tasks, mainly our OER portal, and um, that will it. It. As you can see, OER Info is a joint effort by many organizations and diverse educational fields and uh, how different initiatives were molded into one big project, OER Info, Jan will tell us now. Yes, exactly. So I'm, I'm going to give you a very brief history of OER Info and um, Sigurd already mentioned um, that I will today especially speak about a policy um, perspective. And so that's not completely true for the um, history I'm going to give you now. Um, but um, I, I will try to focus a little bit on, on the policy perspective here. And I'm also trying to focus a little bit on the prehistory of OER um, info, because when I reflected on um, yeah, presenting the history of OER info, especially from a policy point, I thought that the prehistory might have been um, perhaps even more interesting um, than the history of the um, project itself. So um, I, I'm, I'm going back actually to 2011 and I, I identified two starting points for, for OER info. And, and it's quite interesting to see that one was um, a, a, a big scandal, which was uh, triggered by the publishers who tried to survey um, teachers in Germany with software. And this caused quite a lot of resistance on the side of um, uh, of the teachers and out of this came a movement of teachers um, who, who thought about how, how can, can we handle um, resources better and how can we avoid being surveyed by, by publishers uh, when doing our job. And so this was actually, I, I guess, the starting point for the bottom-up movement in Germany. And at the same time, um, we, we saw 2012, um, the UNESCO World Congress um, and, and the declaration on the OER, which was obviously more a button, a top down approach. Um, but these two things came together so that we had a very luckily, I would say, coincidence of, of, of forces coming from bottom up and from top down and declaring. And um, as far as the um, World Congress is uh, concerned, I, I would like to remember um, Fred Mulder, who, who had a saying at that time, where's Germany? Because Germany was missing uh, at 
at the um, at the World Congress, and this was distributed uh, into Germany, and so there was a perceived um, lack of presence, and and so I think policy made, makers had the feeling of of not being ahead enough and and having forgotten something, and they tried to to catch up with the uh, um, with the uh, movement in other countries, and I think this I mentioned this because I think it, it it's something which worked out um, for policy making and it might be something like a strategy which could be used to um, um, to motivate policy makers in other countries so after this um, uh, we, we saw a four years um, um, phase of, of discussion and and this is quite interesting as well became because also you can see here, impulses came from from many different institutions and and levels so we we had um after the um unesco congress um the starting of experts hearing by the federal ministry of education um and there were several other others uh, following by it so experts were being um invited and and the topic was discussed um in 2013 we we uh, saw the eu um, initiative opening up education, which brought new impulses from, from another multinational institution. I already mentioned uh, UNESCO. So additionally, there was um, uh, the EU and also the OECD, which all was pointing into the direction of um, open education. And so I think that, that German policymaking uh, felt forced to, to get deeper into this topic. And so there were um, initially three studies funded on, on OER. I think one was of the international situation. Um, the second one was on legal aspects. And the third one was on, on metadata, which is quite interesting because it's a specialist topic, which was very addressed early in, in Germany. Um, and I think it's, it's characteristic for OER info that there has been somehow a strong focus on, on, on national infrastructure from the beginning on. In 2013, we um, saw the first OER conferences, um, and um, this was um, connected to a bar camp. Jöran had already started uh, bar camping back in 2012, so this is uh, actually um, the, the origin of the, or big a point, a big part of the bottom-up um, movement, which was being supported by the bar camps. And um, so 2013, we saw the first conference, um, which was uh, provided and run by Wikimedia at that time, which was another important player who pushed the topic. And, and there were much discussions going on on these conferences. And um, so this, I guess, was another important thing to build up pressure and proceed with the understanding of the very complex topic of open education and open educational resources. Um, in, I think it was 2014, we saw the announcement of the Hamburg Open Online University. So there came um, individual states doing first lighthouse projects on OER and announcing getting into the topic. So things started to get into practice. And um, then politically, it was quite interesting that the topic was addressed to a rather low hierarchy working group which consisted of um, members of um, the federal ministry and the cultus minister conference which um, is the representation of the states and um, so it was a little bit out of focus and under the radar and um, they they really provided very made good very good work and and provided a very good um, short but good report and which um, it, which um, recommended the introduction of OER. So, and this actually, Sigurd, could you uh, switch the slide, please? This actually led us to the um, to the core funding line, um, which um, started 2016 with the phase one, and and we had two pillars of this funding line. The one was um, uh, a central information site, which is OER Info, and, and probably some of you know it. And um, the other one was 
26 train the trainers project. So we, we had a very broad approach focusing on cap capacity building, on, on building up um, personal capacity to handle OER. And this, I think, was quite important uh, to see that it, it happened in, in every educational sector. So, so one special thing about OER Info is that it addressed all of the educational sectors. Um, so there was a little bit of um, preparation there and the first phase ended uh, by the end of 2018. So um, there were, I think, some few um, of these train the trainer projects, uh, which um, proceeded a little bit longer, but but uh, to simplify, you can say end of 2018 is the end of phase one. And um, then the uh, project was continued, but only for the OER info um, information side. So, um, and also for, for jointly, which, which was uh, another project coming out of phase one, which supported um, community building. But these train the trainers projects have not been um, continued in phase two. And um, yes, maybe uh, you have already heard it, but I can say it right now here and introduce it as an important information. Uh, OER Info is currently not being uh, continued. So they, I, I think there are still being um, um, discussions going on on, on how uh, the project can be continued. But it's, it's a quite interesting thing to see that despite many successes, which we will see in, in the presentation here, um, there's currently no decision to continue this work. And I think it's uh, something uh, which, which depends on the, yeah, if you're dealing with policy making, you have to, to accept that there are many irrational things taking place and that things are not going um, planfully and, and rationally as you hope uh, sometimes. And with this, I'm uh, coming to the end of the short history of OER Info and give, over, give back to Sigrid. Thank you. Um, as Jan pointed out, the situation in Germany before 2016 was that the subject matter of OER was far from being implemented in education and practice. And this was practically the goal of OER Info to yeah, accelerate the uptake of OER in all educational sectors. Um, to achieve this goal, we developed a strategy um, that consists basically of three pillars. Um, the first one is information. As Jan mentioned before, at the core of OER Info is the OER Info platform, which provides different groups of audiences with information on OER. Um, we have information on licensing, on finding OER, um, on how to produce a worksheet, etc. The information is presented in, in very different formats as text and video and audio. Um, and the entire content is, of course, under CC licenses and can be used in other contexts. Um, basically, this is meant to help others help themselves as a means of getting to know more about OER. Then the next pillar is the transfer pillar. That means basically um, that uh, transfer of know-how into different to different educators via workshops and events. Daniel will talk about this in a moment. And um, third, the networking, which itself can be maybe divided into networking community and policy. Um, the networking is taking into account different stakeholders, um, bring together early adopters, OER experts, and of course, an interested audience in formats such as bar camps. Joran will talk about that. And um, then we have the community work targeted at activists and leaders and OER doers, mainly via social media. And third, of course, is um, advancing OER by knowing what's going on. So the collection of all kinds of information and we collect all kinds of information and try to weaponize them, so to speak, for policy making. This is the third strand, which is basically um, done by Jan and um, the OER world map.
the OER info architecture Jan just talked about it briefly consisted in of two phases, one from 2016 and to 2018 and the second one from 2018 up until now. Um, seven institutions are at the heart of the project working closely together implementing the strategy. We all come from different backgrounds um, and five of them are here. Um, the institution addressing vocational training um, and the institution ad addressing adult education and uh, the institution that addresses the schools um, are not here today, but we're um, trying to talk about their experiences as well. Um, so I think our strong suit is working across educational set fields and um, doing both addressing target audiences such as teachers, um, but also fostering intersectional exchange. We also have two networking initiatives, the OER camps, which we'll hear in a moment from Joran, and um, the initiative jointly, which is about community building, but also um, it's a big platform that provides OER coaches with materials. And um, from 2016 to 2018, um, 23 individual projects were also funded um, with the aim of capacity building in different institutions um, like universities or among teachers. And this entire program is funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. And um, as uh, Jan already told the sad news um, where info ends at the, with uh, ends at the end of December um, and uh, we, are, we are looking for uh, means to continue the project or at least continue the website um, we are very hopeful still hopeful that uh, we can achieve this and uh, we are info will continue um, to exist. Um, Sigrid, there's a question yes. from Robert. Um, could you say a little bit more about why the, the, the OER info will not be continued? Is there a clear mm -hmm. reason for that? Um, I think there are several reasons for it. Um, one is, um, as Joran pointed out, um, in Germany, the education system is quite complicated. You have the federal ministry, which cannot really target schools, um, but can work on a yeah, um, on a rather um, common level or general level. And then you have the ministries of education in the States and they basically have the power on what's going on in education. And those two sections are always fighting um, or not really working together. You can have good examples of, of that during the Corona crisis and um, and they could not unite, they can't be united on the subject of OER. So um, the federal government, which is our side, does something. And um, now the states are doing other projects in OER. So this is, I guess, is one, one reason why OER is not continue to be continued at this point. And um, then another reason is the Corona crisis. Um, the federal government is very much uh, um, preoccupied um, on dealing with it. And um, unfortunately, we could not make them see that OER is um, a solution or a motor or um, a very big part in, uh, in, in solving the crisis. But for them, it's just a subject on top and um, where is no personal resources or no money resources to deal with it just right now. Um, and um, uh, uh, Robert, uh, you suggested there's too much grassroots. I cannot say that, I, from my point of view, I would not say that this is, um, is, uh, is one of the reasons why it's not funded because um, in the OI info project, um, for example, the building server where I work and also um, the um, FVU, we are on and the, um, the, the, the vocational training and the adult training, we are all um, institutions of the government. So um, no really grassroots, uh, organization 
And um, yeah, well, I think, still think the broadness of our uh, uh, education sector is rather an asset than a hindrance. Yeah, well, um, and we, we still think that um, there might be funding to come. Okay, I will uh, give um, over to Gabi. Yeah, um, hi, um, I'm Gabi Frankfurt from, from Jörn Konsorten and we've been working for, um, I've been working, sorry, for the um, OER InfoBlog uh, editorial team since the launch of Informationsstelle OER. Um, and as we have already heard from Sigrid and Jan, the aim of the project was to build a web platform around the topic of OER. And the task of the blog editorial team um, was to compile knowledge about OER for the community and to support the exchange of expertise within the community um, to ensure a sustained and broad visibility of OER and to create a contact point for the German OER community via this platform. Um, a few facts and figures about our work may help you to get an overview. Uh, Jörn had already been operating the predecessor of uh, OER Info, the OER Transferstelle, since 2014. Uh, 40, um, Therefore, when OER was launched, there was already some content on which we could build. Um, since 2016, we have been producing and publishing this content and these formats for OER Info. Um, it was more than 500 blog posts, 44 podcasts, um, over 180 videos, mainly interviews and explanatory videos. And then web talks, newsletters, and so on. Um, the content in the blog was accompanied by articles in the social media channels of OER Info. On Twitter and Facebook, for example, we referred to the blog post. For this, for this purpose, and also for the exchange of information among um, the OER community, the hashtag OERDE was introduced at the beginning of OER Info. Uh, project. The hashtag refers um, spe spe specifically to a uh, German speaking world and it is intended for community exchange, discussions, announcements, and questions on all aspects of OER. Um, right now, the hashtag OERD is um, uh, well established and widely used. Um, in order to achieve the project objectives, it was necessary to um, present the current state of knowledge on OER in the German-speaking German world, but also internationally. Um, to this end, we provided ongoing reporting on current issues on fundamental questions, and we also reported from international conferences, such as the OE Global. The aim was to present uh, the diversity of the various initiatives and approaches, and thus to support an exchange between the initiatives. We presented the various OER projects, their respective objectives, and also introduced the people behind the projects. So much for what we have done over the past four years. With regard to the project goals, I can say that with the constant and up-to-date reporting, with media partnership of the OER comms, which uh, Joran will talk about later, and with the fact that we have provided many different formats, we've been able to reach a great many people with the topic of OER. The Informationsstelle OER is perceived in the educational landscape as a contact point even though much more work is needed to make OER mainstream at some point. We have created a central contact point for the community, which should be further developed in the next step, I think. If the Informationsstelle OER were to be continued at some point in the future, I believe 
that the peer information service should be supplemented by an advice center for questions and issues relating to OER. And this brings me to the question of what could have gone differently or what could possibly be done even better in the future. Well, it has been shown that a pool of information such as that provided by OER Info is well suited for getting started. However, when specific um, questions about open materials, creative commons licenses or other topics need to be clarified, people often do not know who to turn to. There's still a lack of contact points that offer advice and concrete assistance on OER. In the best case, the Informationsstelle OER should have been a help center, I think. For example, by referring to experts or by pointing out the places on the internet which could offer answers to respective questions. Um, I'm a librarian myself, and I know that OER librarians are already active in some libraries, but uh, some universities in Germany also have coordinators for the topic of OER. Um, so it would be conceivable to have a scenario where there is a contact point for questions within the Informationsstelle OER. OER could then pass these to onto libraries or universities where OER experts work and who could who would um, then help with specific questions. Maybe. Well, have the objectives set for the community been achieved? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. Since providing advising and information on OER is an ongoing task, the question does not seem to me very helpful. So, but, um, but yes, because it's true that um, OER Info has brought together knowledge on OER, has supported the exchange of expertise, and has ensured um, that the topic has a lasting and broad public visibility. And a contact point for the German-speaking OER community was also created. But the provision of advice and information on the range of OER topics should be an ongoing task. But what remains of it now that financial support has ended and it is completely open whether OER info can be revived and at some point in the future. Without a permanent Informationsstelle OER, all effects will fizzle out. Um, even if the website remains available on the web, much of its content um, will soon be outdated, I think. So that was my part. Um, thank you. And now I hand over to Johan, um, who talks about the networking aspect and about four years of OER camps. You're muted, uh, Johan. Okay, so I'll try to give you a five minute version of the OER camps in Germany. Um, for anyone who's interested in not only the five minute and the bright version, uh, there's a recording of a talk I had earlier with a 25 minute version on the OER camps. I'll share the link with you on the chat in five minutes from now. Um, I think, um, I brought you mainly pictures from OER camps. So um, this is how it looks like. This is one picture from the first OER camp in Bremen in 2012. And it was mainly about people coming together because there were not that such a thing as a community until then. So in Bremen in 2012, I think it was maybe 70 people. And that was probably like 90% of all the people interested in OER in Germany uh, at this time. Um, I was just thinking when, when Jan was talking about that he uh, just arrived from uh, Paris, I remember, and uh, gave us the insights from the uh, UNESCO uh, point of view. And um, for all of you uh, who do not know about the bar camp idea, the OER camp it was and is a bar camp. So it's about people coming together and sharing their own questions and their own experiences. So this is a picture from the last in real life event we had earlier this year in Hamburg. 
And I really like the picture because it's very much about what bar camps often look like. So it's very much uh, sharing and talking to each other and working on your own questions and even your own resources. So a typical bar camp begins with the people coming together in a plenary session. And I don't know if you can see it at the end of the room, there are people lining up. This is uh, normally the, the first hour of a bar camp. Everyone who wants to provide a session, which is bar camp language for, for a workshop, uh, lines up and steps forward and says, I want to provide a session on this topic or on this question. And it's not unusual to only have a question. So I step forward and I say, hey, my name is Joran, and I'm currently working on this question. I'm looking for other um, individuals in this room interested in the same question. And then it's not about finding many as many people as possible, but as finding the people with the same question um, as your question is. So um, this is what the schedule then looks like. Um, we have parallel sessions and uh, rooms um, and it takes as much rooms as there are people providing a session. So it's really a simple format. It's not rocket science, but it really is helpful when you have a group with at least, I would say, a third of people experienced in the field so that they can at least bring in their own questions and their own thoughts. It's not a format only for 100% um, newcomers to the format. So the sessions then can look like this. Uh, it looks like drinking coffee and it's pretty much about drinking coffee, but with a common uh, question. Uh, it can be more than three people. So this is also a very typical picture from a bar camp, people sitting in a circle and discussing a question. It's also okay to, to um, tell people more about your own projects, about your own experiences. So it's also okay to, to um, have a hands-on workshop. People, I don't know, this is a, a somewhat tinkering around workshop. I don't know what it was about. Um, or even lecturing people. So this is one of the great pioneers of um, open licensing in Germany, Paul Klimpel. I think his uh, work on the um, problems, problems with the NC license is, uh, has been translated into 20 languages, uh, something like this. Um, but it's also always the idea of people coming together to share their, their thoughts and their questions. I also brought you some uh, numbers and figures on the OER camp, only one slide because it's only the uh, five minute version. So in the last eight years, we had uh, 25 events so far. At the beginning, before there was the public funding, we had like one event per year and it was very, I don't know, in a circle or hard core. Uh, so the core of the community event. Um, and with the funding, we could broaden these circles so that people interested in OER, but not so much that they would go to Bremen for a three-day event are coming together. We had like an, at the end about five or six events per year, uh, more than 3,200 participants. And those participants were the, the, the ones doing 480 sessions. So um, we, differentiate between the sessions and the workshops. The workshops are formats that we pre-plan, so like in a normal conference. Um, and um, we also mix the format of a bar camp with other more traditional formats like workshops. And I think one goal that was really important to me is that we uh, reach always more than 50% newcomers. In the last two years, even 75% newcomers per event. And that's also a crucial um, number when it comes to how many um, old timers you need in the event to, to uh, continue um, the, the growth of a community. There were some spin offs. So um, we learned that many people were at least as much interested in the format of learning because it's a format of, of open education. And um, so we uh, provided all the materials, the resources that we developed for organizing OER camps as um, openly licensed resources. Uh, we published a book and uh, had trainings on how to OER camp. So when the funding now will finish, um, we hope that there will be somewhat a sustainability because people learned how to organize their own OER camps or their own bar camps. 
Um, I skipped the, the times of COVID-19 because it's not too exciting that we did online bar camps, so or online events and webinar series. This is one last chart I want to present you because it's really typical for OER camps. This was the question uh, we had when we um, evaluated um, the bar camp participants and we asked them which field of education would you assign yourself to and um, you see that it's really, really a broad distribution. So it's approximately around the same size for um, school, higher education and further education. And it's important to know that these people were visiting the same event. So it was not an OER camp for school or not an OER camp for higher education, but these people were coming together in the same events and sharing across the, the sector borders. Uh, of course, they could have their sessions and they could say, I have a session specific on, I don't know, early childhood education resources. Um, but I think it was an asset that they were sharing their experiences over these uh, more traditional borders. Yes. Should ring in a minute from now. I like the idea of Sigrid being like, like our anchor woman. So I'll give back to Sigrid. Next up is Jan again. Um, Jan, um, you're muted. You, you're, yes. Sorry, I, I muted. I was muted twice. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm, I'm missing now a, a, a picture which I implemented um, on, on the slide, but maybe it was in an earlier version. And um, so um, why I'm speaking here about policy making is that we had the OER policy, you know, the OER world map implemented in OER Info. And um, policy making is a quite complex topic and it's um, connected to um, to control of systems. So I think it uh, can be understood or it has similarities with the steering process. And I think um, that um, the OER world map has been implemented into the um, OER info project was another quite typical and characteristic thing of the OER info project. So there was an approach of thinking about um, how all these activities could be quantified and, and summarized in order to support um, political um, goal making and, and, and seeing and goal control also there's a monitoring aspect connected uh, which comes in with the OER world map. And um, I think that um, the interesting thing is that uh, we, we, by the way, published two um, major summaries of, of the word in, in uh, of our work in OER Info and about the data we collected for OER Info, so which um, are summarized and available. I will post the links um, uh, just in a moment. Um, these publications have been named OER Atlas, and we planned actually to do a third one at the end of the project um, and currently I'm not sure if we will manage to do it but certainly this would be quite interesting um, to provide the, these quantificational summary of um, uh, the OER info project um, but maybe um, just some lessons learned from our experiences working with the OER world map um, as a part of uh, a central infrastructure. And um, I think that our initial idea that data collection would happen by itself, um, yeah, turned out to be untrue. So, so but what we could see uh, with OER info is that it works pretty well um, if you have somebody who takes care of it. So um, especially in the first phase of the project, we had a dedicated editor um, who just concentrated on OER info and data collection worked pretty well um, at that time. And another lesson learned is that it's working quite well if you are um, connecting it to, to important events like the publication of the Atlas or like conference. 
Um, so um, there, there is actually, um, it, it's, it's working if you take care of it and it's not expensive. So, um, I mean, since the technical platform is there already, you just need to find somebody who takes care of, of, of data collection. And um, I think this is an important insight, um, especially for future um, uh, policy and OER policies and, and initiatives, since they um, should collect and have these data we collected um, anyway. And um, so it's, it's just a thing that you decide doing this and um, that you keep care that maybe you find a stu student editor or something like it um, who keeps care of the data collection. Um, so, um, and another thing was that um, we, uh, that there was no obligation to um, uh, use this data and um, to, to contribute this data. So we always had to ask people, could you please send us the data and could you fill it out? Could you enrich it? Which was okay and worked fine in many cases. But I think another thing which could be helpful for implementing a control system and, and data-based control system like the OER world map um, uh, to, to an OER initiative is to make it obligatory. So that you say, I'm having uh, this major project or this program, and I expect every um, project to share their data so that we have a reliable source of information of this. Um, so, um, yes, I think um, the last thing, um, technical things I said um, are quite um, evolved and um, just for people from other parts of the world, um, what you can see on OER Info is the OER DE Karte and um, this is actually can be implemented for other countries and states quite easily so um, it's uh, made yeah, mainly uh, implementing an iframe into another website um, so um, if you're thinking about doing something like this um, it's not expensive to use it and um, the major task um, is in collecting the data and um, just the last remark, um, we have the OER recommendation um, and the recommendation requires um, or um, um, expects uh, countries uh, to monitor their activities. Um, I think that the experience made with the OER world map in, in Germany are quite encouraging um, that it's possible to, to go in this direction and, and proceed in this direction. And I think that the real potential will come if we find several states using a similar data monitoring system um, and so that they can compare activities in, in different countries. And I, I'm not... Uh, expecting that this will happen, but my opinion at the moment is that it would be possible if there would be the po political will to do it and if there was enough um, decision and commitment uh, to stick with it, um, then we could do it. And um, nevertheless, um, we only focused on quite easy to find uh, things concerning um, educational monitoring. So we concentrated on institutions, on projects, on events, uh, on things which are quite tangible and, and you can see it and you can point to it. If you're thinking about um, uh, OER oh yeah, monitoring in, in a wider sense, um, uh, and if you're thinking about um, pedagogical effectiveness of, of, of open education, what does open education change in the heads of the people? I think that's the thing which is even much <laughs> harder to, to measure, and to be honest, um, I, I currently have no clue how this could be done, but um, the good thing is that there are still some open questions and with this I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my short presentation. See good? Yes, there is a question in the uh, in the chat. Um, Robert asks, can these data be of use in the context of the OER recommendation for nations to report about their progress in implementing? 
Yes, um, I, I mentioned this uh, already in the talk. I think it, it can. So I think it's a good starting point for building up a, um, um, uh, um, a monitoring system for education. And I think it's quite reliable. Um, we have just um, uh, yeah, developed the OE Policy Hub. I'm just posting a link to a video um, which we produced for OE Global um, conference here on the OE Policy Hub. So we are currently trying to um, starting with policy documents and then linking it to activities which results out of um, these policy documents. And um, I definitely think that the OER world map um, is uh, capable and, and could contribute to setting up a, a major um, monitoring system for open education. Um, but for sure, if we really want uh, this to be successful, um, we have been funded by ULIT quite um, fine. So, it, it, but nevertheless, we were a small team. So, so we we had um, maybe. Um, uh, around um, four or five um, um, employees working on the map and, and none of them was full-time working. So you see, um, if, if we really want to take care of it um, and, and use it as a, a means to address the um, OER um, recommendation, um, we, we have to adjust the resources for this, make the team a little bit bigger, and we need a committed um, local um, initiatives who are willing to take this way, who are willing to support this um, approach by providing an editor. There's a second question um, from Igor. He asked to the Best of my knowledge, there is currently no harmonized approach developed to assist countries with reporting on progress in the context of um, the OER recommendation, correct? Yes, I'm, I'm not aware of a harmonized approach to, uh, concerning this as well. I think it's, um, I mean, it's, it's an inter interesting thing if you think about it, um, that um, Maybe uh, collecting these data and reporting is, is is kind of a scary thing for many of it, and I'm I'm quite skeptical if it can be uh, compared to open education, and if it um, might be um, might do harm to open education as well. If you look at quality making, for instance, in the in the um, in the health system in Germany, everything is being measured uh, down to minutes. You, 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 you have two minutes for doing this, two minutes for doing that. And I think we, we should try to avoid uh, this happening for education as well, because open education is about creativity. It's about um, having trust to other people. Um, uh, so so we, we have to take care that, that our um, monitoring process and our management process do not, um, uh, yeah, uh, how do you name it, um, um, adrosseln or the, take away the, the air for people um, to, to work in the edu educational sector. And I think that maybe it's a good idea to, if we, we if the open education uh, community takes a proactive approach in this way and so that we can provide measuring systems which fit to our own procedures and own processes so that they are not being given by, by people who do not understand what they do and who do not, do not see the effect which these approaches can have to open education. Okay, um, with regard to the time, I would um, uh, um, give um, Daniel now the opportunity to talk about um, the transfer strategies. Yes, I unmuted myself. Okay, I did not forget it. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about our transfer activities. And first of all, my name is Daniel Otto. As you might know, I'm from the Learning Lab at the University of Duisburg Essen. And I was uh, responsible uh, for the transfer to the uh, educational sector of higher education. But I'm today also speaking on behalf of my colleagues. Uh, who could not be there, who were responsible for uh, vocational education, uh, adult education, and school. 
and I'm going to take a little bit um, of what we've done um, during uh, these two years uh, of uh, the second funding period. And um, this mainly uh, concerns transfer, mainly concerns increasing uh, the adoption or slash use of OER in all the educational sectors. And um, what we did in terms of measures is to um, organize workshops, uh, give lectures, uh, further trainings, um, just to teach um, interested people, for example, school teachers or lecturers at higher education, make them aware of OER, teaching them to use OER, giving them information um, of what OER is. And I'm just trying to briefly reflect on some of the main um, impressions, outcomes um, we have uh, gained during these two years. And um, first of all, for the first um, for the first funding period, there was a little bit of a problem that we did not really evaluate um, what we were doing. So there was not kind of an objective evaluation uh, with the leading research questions. So um, interviewing, for example. Uh, people who joined the workshop and for the second period wanted to do that a little bit um, differently and we designed um, a survey and distributed it um, at all the, the measures uh, we made, for example, and, and, and workshops we gave and lectures we gave. And um, we were mainly interested in um, learning more about um, the motivation um, about uh, our participants. And um, we used that um, by applying a concept of attitudes, so investigating, surveying the attitudes of the people, so learning more about um, their motivation um, for joining the events. And I don't know if I can go to the next slide myself or if somebody, because I'm here with my... Uh, oh, Sigrid, can you go maybe to the next slide? Um, I don't know why this doesn't work. Ah, I cannot. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, yes, uh, so we surveyed um, all the participants of our measures. Of course, not everyone participated, but at least uh, 207 um, persons completed um, the, the survey we distributed. And um, as I said, we used the concept of attitudes. And this is mainly just, um, just briefly um, consists of three parts. So um, first of all, a behavioral component. So um, just knowing about the intention um, people have to, to use OER. Um, a cognitive component, this is more about the knowledge and beliefs uh, that the people uh, have and an effective component, um, which is more about the, the feelings and emotions um, they connect uh, with the topic of OER. And um, of course, we could observe that uh, we could state that the people who um, came to the workshops, um, two thirds um, indicate concrete intention and behavior to use OER in their educational sectors. So we surveyed all educational sectors. So this was really um, this was really high the approval of the people. Um, interestingly, we can see that um, for the cognitive components, so um, the knowledge and beliefs about um, OER. Uh, so meaning, uh, for example, if OER um, facilitates, uh, facilitates innovative teaching, for example, if OER um, increases um, uh, the use of OER in education, if, if, if it uh, facilitates uh, legal issues, um, for example, this was um, rather moderate and also um, the level about OER, so they had to self-assess their level, um, was also quite moderate. Um, what we can state, however, is that especially the effective components, so the feelings and emotions they had for the topic of OER, mainly um, can be mainly described as, for example, the belief, the the um, the urgency of um, facilitating cooperation and sharing of material, um, the need to cooperate with others. These, um, these were uh, rated uh, really as high um, by the participants. So if you could go back to the uh, slide before, uh, Sigrid, that would be excellent. So um, we could say that the results show that especially the values and ideas behind um, OER are the main drivers to engage in it and not. 
um, the concrete um, beliefs about it. So they say, oh, although it's uh, time consuming to use OER, for example, in my context, I believe that the basic idea behind OER is uh, very good and is desirable. So maybe you can um, just, uh, just conclude that very um, shortly. And what um, those um, people would need um, uh, to, to increase uh, their engagement in OER is especially um, incentives on an individual level. So incentives uh, could be, for example, for higher education project funding or recognition of their activities, for example, on their teaching record. But also, and I, I think um, this was mentioned by Jan before, a structural measures like a policy, for example, um, to support uh, those who are willing and, and those um, who are willing um, to uh, to lead. Otherwise, there won't be any increase in um, in OER adoption. Um, the second problem we observed um, during the measures we um, we did was um, the content problem. So we still have a problem that although, meanwhile, several repositories exist, there's not enough content in it to um, fed those who are interested in engaging in OER. So for example, if we have workshops, a lot of people are coming and saying, okay, this is really interesting. Um, I'm a Turkish teacher. Uh, can you give me material, for example, for the context of uh, this teaching? And um, honestly, we have to say, no, there's not enough content there. And maybe we can um, spur them to say, okay, more content um, needs to be provided. So that is really a, a problem. Um, at, the, at the moment, there are a lot of federal uh, initiatives to um, set up repositories and just fill them with content. I think this would be very important um, for the next years. And um, I think also, there was mentioned before, we have the problem that we have, that we are federal states. So we have 16 um, different states who all have their idea of how to um, obtain uh, results for OER that also makes it complicated. And uh, this is um, one, um, uh, one, one major uh, step could be um, a meta search engine. We're working on that in another project, um, kind of uh, the Google for OER. I think this would be um, very good. Yes, I hope because <laughs> I got several minutes, uh, several messages that I only have one minute left or three minutes left. Uh, so maybe if there are overall questions or question concerning transfer, please shoot. Thank you very much. So if there are any questions, please post them in the chat. Um, so I, I have uh, one question. Um, uh, one thing I know from Germany is that you always use German term terminology. Uh, but mm -hmm. here you're talking about OER and, and, and about open educational resources. Uh, is that a deliberate choice or not? Sorry, I, I, I don't know if I got the question right. Can you can you maybe reformulate? Um, I, uh, I know that Germany always uses German terminology for everything. Ah, okay, you mean that um, and, of, uh, and, okay. Now I get and it. here so you why... use the English term OER, Open Educational Resources. Yeah, we also have a translation, yes, uh, Janus wrote it, Freie uh, Bildungsmaterialien, but in this case we use the term OER and I don't know uh, if that was to our advantage, because maybe it would have been better if we have used or established a German translation but we um, did not, and in, in my personal opinion, I would say um, that's a bit problematic because um, these three, <laughs> uh, yeah, OER, it is not really, uh, it is not really, um, I don't know, intuitive. And if you talk to people um, about OER, they first of all say, okay, what's that? Uh, I don't understand it. And uh, yeah, I, I think if we would do, if we do it again, maybe we could think of a German translation would be better in my opinion, but I don't know if my colleagues uh, think it the same way. Actually, uh, interesting comments from uh, Joran. <laughs> um, so we ran out of time. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank the panelists for this interesting overview of uh, the German activities. I think it was interesting to see, and I, I do hope that uh, you find the, the, the funding to continue uh, OER info. 
because I think it's it's a really important uh, for the future of uh, open educational research in Germany to continue the, uh, your activities. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, Igor, you can stop the recording.